Can you say hard hats, folks? Hard hats, lunch pails, steel to a boot? Anything short of a championship this year is a failure. Look real. at this boomer right here. You've just got so much talent here. Somebody say we need to apologize for Jalen. Can I call the John? What are we apologizing for? What do we say? What do we do? <laughs> Mm -mm. Yeah. What up, everybody? Celtics are back in the win column, just like we knew they would be. Never a doubt. No panic over here on this show. We erased all the panic meter segments uh, of the last couple nights. No more blame pies today. Joined <laughs> by A. Sherrod Blakely and the birthday boy, Bobby Manning. Happy birthday, Bobby. He is... <laughs> Join, joining us on his birthday, birthday, what a guy! We should have the birthday, birthday graph, with the crown and the bait and the cake. Birthday cam. Damn it, Amit! Where's birthday cam? <laughs> okay, that's okay. We'll give you we'll, for your birthday, Bobby. We'll let you talk about Luke at some point in the show, even though <laughs> there's absolutely nothing to talk about because I don't think he stepped foot in the court tonight. It was a I Tillman know. game. Tillman game with a little more probably physicality expected out there, so they put Tillman in. Celtics come away with a 104-92 win. Put the clamps on the Pelicans in this one after a, a, a tough first quarter. They put the clamps. They then put the clamps on the Pelicans coming out of that first quarter. And, and man, that, that second half was the type of play that I think we can, we typically expect to see from this team on that side. And the defense has been has been MIA as of late, but it, it showed itself tonight with a fully healthy, uh, you know, lineup. Uh, for the first time in a while. So we'll start with you, Shira. Actually, we'll start with the birthday boy. Yeah, let's, let's get the, the birthday, birthday boy's boy face. <laughs> yeah, the floor. Scary one early, Jimmy. You thought this one might go another way based on that 11-point lead the Pelicans built early. But uh, Boston responded, and they stayed with it, too. I remember that first Pelicans game, which is two months ago now. You had a similar start where Herb Jones hit a bunch of threes. Uh, they had to roll with those punches. I think they trailed in that game at points too. Uh, and then in the second half, he went cold and ignoring him and some other guys on that Pelicans offense allowed the Celtics to really muck it up, make it tough on Zion uh, that night, make it tough on Brandon Ingram who missed this game. Uh, so in the end, Herb Jones, six of 15, four and nine from three, he got going in a big way early, but didn't make a three, I believe in the second half. Uh, so that was a big difference in this one, swinging the way it did. But it was an underrated part of the, those Hawks games, Jimmy. The defense yeah. wasn't great, and they've ramped it up in these games. I thought tonight, or this game, I thought tonight was the best defense in that third quarter I've seen from the Celtics all year. And what do you know? They allowed 11 points. 11 points in a quarter. 11 points to an Joe's NBA usually, team. Joe's usually looking for them to hold the other team under 30, and they held them to under 15. Yeah. And that was yeah. after they, they, they basically came out strong in that second half after the way it closed your odd. Yeah. And the way they close, how did they close that second quarter? With your Derek guy. White three pointer. I don't, At the buzzer. I don't know. How many, listen, he will get into closing at, at another date or maybe later in the show. But the mm -hmm. thing, the thing about this, this win, as Bobby talked about the defense, which was important, but to me, the, the bigger issue or the bigger thing that they were able to deal with was how do you handle prosperity against a team that is missing a key player? You, and no Brandon Ingram, a, a really high-impact mm -hmm. score. We've seen the Celtics, when teams are a little bit under man, play down a level or two or 22, uh, and that didn't happen in this game. In fact, it was just the opposite. They ratcheted everything up, taking advantage of this Pelicans team being without one of their better players. Uh I thought you go down the line. The guy that I really liked a lot in this game was Porzingis. Um, I thought he yeah. checked off so many boxes for them. Scoring. He needed a bounce back too, Sherrod. What's that? He needed a bounce back from those Atlanta games he too. He did. He did. He. He. I mean, he definitely was 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 put through the torture chamber in Atlanta, where they got they just pretty much had their way with him. Got, got picked on a lot in that game. Uh, and this was I, I, this was a good bounce back game for him. But more than that, it was his. his he showed the versatility that we've been talking about all season with him, the ability to impact the game in a multitude of ways, whether it's scoring, rebounding, getting his hands on steals, altering shots, doing a little bit of everything that they needed to get this win. And just remind us all why they're, uh, you know, the team that everyone is chasing. But to me, 
And I think, Bobby, you touched on this a little bit, or, or Jimmy, I can't remember who, when you talked about Tillman and just the physicality mm -hmm. that yeah. he brings to the game. You look at that Atlanta game, and you look at how they're playing Tatum, you look at this game, you look at how they're playing. Teams are ratcheting up their physicality on him and this entire Celtics team. And the Celtics, it seems as though they didn't see that coming. Uh, and, but I think in this game, I think they went into it expecting it to be a more physical game and prepared for it to be a more physical game. I think part of what teams are looking at when they play the Celtics is that, you know, they have great talent, but where is their level of physicality? What can happen if we ratchet up our physicality against them? How will they respond to that? And we the results have been mixed. I mean, we've seen them tonight, for example, they bounced back in the second half and had a pretty – the score doesn't reflect how Boston dominated the second half of this game. Um, they were clearly the superior team. But you go back to Atlanta, Atlanta was able to hang around in large part because of their offensive rebounds, which comes back to effort and comes back to being physical. Uh, so that, if, if you're the Celtics, that has to be something that you're giving a little mm -hmm. bit more uh, attention to as you as you start to ratchet up and ramp up for the playoffs. Yeah, that, that physicality, Sherrod, I mean, you, you hit it in the nail on the head there. That's what you're going to see when the playoffs come around. You're going to see – you're going to see teams wrap it up, ratchet it up on both ends. You're going to obviously see a higher competition too. That's why it's like, I don't get too high. And I've said it before. I just don't get too high when the Celtics blow out a bad team, because that's not, that's not reality. Really. That's not, that's not going to matter in the end. Yeah. You want to see them beat those teams, obviously. Um, but I'm looking at games like tonight and yeah, they didn't have Ingram, but this was a game against a team that's playing great basketball. Second half of the season, one of the better teams in the NBA Zion's um, you know, I would say looking like some of the best basketball he's played. He came out, I think, what do you have, 12 points in the first quarter tonight? It looked like he was going to have one of those 40-point nights where he just went off. But you got to give credit to the Celtics. Jalen Brown, got to give a gold star to Jalen Brown tonight because Over I thought – uh, Yeah. I mean, he was <laughs> – every time I looked, he was on the floor. I don't know if it was his sneakers or what was going on, but uh, he's he took some bumps and bruises tonight. But he stepped up, especially on the defensive end took on Zion, which is a tall task. I mean, this is that this is a 200. That's a tall, wide test. 300 it's a pounds. wide test, Jimmy. It yeah, ain't just tall. It's a it's wide tall test. and wide test. Absolutely. That's the table. He, he eats the table, man. So, I mean, for, for Brown to be able to, to play that way on both ends of the court, had some timely buckets for them, too, when they came out kind of flat offensively before Derek White started to do his thing. Um, and then Tatum got going. They were frustrated a little bit in that first half. You could see it um, with the refereeing and almost fell into a, a little bit of bad habit. Tatum, that, that was, I was with Eddie House on that. That was a bad team, man. I mean, a flick of the wrist and he's getting teed up from the other, from across the court. Like, that's to me unacceptable. And that's just. <laughs> you can't wave the ref off, though. He knows that at this point. But here's it, guys here's do a lot worse, man. They really do. And that was and that was a point that Eddie was making that you know you got guys like Draymond Green who are basically you know effing and bleeping <laughs> everything and then some to an official yeah. and they get grace. But Tatum, who at that point had a couple of bad whistles that didn't go his way and just says just weighs him off, doesn't even say just weighs him off, and you get a tech for that. And right. and here this is to me the most <laughs> indicative moment of the officiating was the fact that. Both coaches had first half challenges and both coaches won their challenges. That says a lot about how that game is going to officiate. Right. The fact that both sides clearly got screwed at some point, recognize it. And you know how coaches are about the challenges. They don't like to use them early, but they knew that they were spot on. They knew they were right. Mm -hmm. uh, it was that kind of night, but I, I, I give the Celtics credit for Bobby's again, getting dragged. Bobby's getting it's dragged in the comments now because he defended <laughs> the tech. On his birthday, well, no less. It's not what? even the, it's not even the tech. It's just him knowing what they're gonna call. Sure. In you want them spots. to keep their emotions in check, in a way. You don't want you them want to go. To. You don't want them to get into a. Back it's not like refereeing. what was that one that was the worst yeah. ever when he when he like bounced the ball a little bit and they called it like stuff like that. You're like, what, yeah. what's wrong with these refs? But right. they've made clear at different points that you can't do that. Like wave off, like screw you, kind of motion at them. Like they're yeah. always going to call it that. So, and he knows that it's happened countless times. So if you want to take one in that spot and you think it's going to make a difference, I think that's something he's talked about at different points, uh, taking one on purpose. But if you didn't want one there, you can't do that. So it all depends what he was looking for. We've had a couple of comments uh, like this. this. This is a preview of the playoff rotation. This should be the playoff rotation. Do you guys get the same sense that 
that um, Joe was treating this uh, sort of like a playoff rotation situation. Sherrod shaking his head. No. What's what's the prognosis? Well, the prognosis is that the, the group that they went with, I think this might be a lineup you may see in the playoffs, but I don't think that anything is set in stone. I, I still think that Luke is going to get more minutes than Xavier Tillman uh, with all is said mm. and done. Um, this is I, a good I, Tillman I, game, though. You thought so? A, I thought it was, I thought it was a really I thought good it started off. I thought it started off a little shaky for sure, um, but he right. came into his own. And again, it's it's just the the you needing a bigger body out there. So the tough yeah. thing with Tillman, body. I had a long conversation with him uh, before the second Atlanta game. And he basically said, first I asked him about the knee and he said, he's going to have to manage that the rest of the way. He missed the game over the last week here with that. But he also said he feels like he's 75% of the way acclimated. And he said that 25% he still has left to go is knowing all the plays being on the same page as everybody. And you do see that a little bit out there with him offensively. Sometimes yeah. it just looks like he doesn't know where to go. And more often than not, he's just standing in the corner and uh, he hasn't been able to knock down that three this year. I don't think he took one tonight. Um, and I asked him about that too. Yeah. And uh, I was like, oh, you know, you've, you're floating around three for 13 there, whatever it was. And he's like, we're talking about percentages. I'm shooting one again. <laughs> he kind of, he didn't love right. that question, but he is, struggling with those threes out there at least for the limited amount he's taking them and if that's going to be the only role he plays on offense is spacing and taking threes it's going to be tough to space out there but the good thing is when he's playing with Horford Horford can space and he can play more in the middle he tacked the basket at one point and uh you know throw up a nice floater I thought last game driving downhill I think Drew or uh Eddie said that when teams ignore you, at least you're going to have that runway to the basket. I think that mm -hmm. works well for him. He kind of botched that transition play later in the game, but you know, you're not expecting him to make plays in the open floor. So if he's going to defend at this level and be part of a dynamic like this defensively, you have to keep trying to integrate him. You can't have these nights where he's just not playing at all. And it's tough because you're dealing with that trade off with Luke, who I think is just such a more steady hand offensively. Uh, but the good thing is, as we've said all along, is you have both. So if someone's not playing well, you can go to the other one. If it's a better matchup for one, you can go to that guy. And you don't have to really feed both. I think they're both okay sitting on the bench uh, when they need to. So that was the reason they went and got him at the in the first place, is that he's someone who just adds to what they do. He doesn't need to take away from you know anyone else out there. But he's still figuring it out to some degree. So yeah. yeah. So right. is it Tillman over Cornette, Bobby, or you still think, like with Sherrod, you think Cornette has that edge come playoff time? Or is it strictly matchup-based? Well, let's say it's Philly round one and you're going against some B. I don't think there's any doubt you're going to see Tillman in a series like that. Uh, Miami and Bam, uh, you're going to need him in some secondary minutes against him, especially if you're going to be switching defensively, which it looks like they want to do. The thing about Luke, and again, I think he's in a really good place offensively. And now that he's offensive rebounding, that just adds another layer to what he brings you on that end. But if you're going to play that defense with him, just drop back at the rim, you know, teams are going to shoot over you. And the Hawks did that. They like those mid-rangers. I think teams like the Heat, even the Sixers to some degree, will step into that mid-range area. And they're just going to shoot right over Luke. At least with Tillman, you have a guy that can switch and play into the body against all five positions out there i really sherrod he and al beyond the resemblance everybody talks about they look good out there together like they have a nice dynamic between those two and the numbers are really good too even though they've had a few clunkier games on offense yeah but you can get by that if you're playing elite defense and that's the one thing that the celtics i think when you play tillman more they're i just think they're a better defensive team when he's out there than, than luke uh because of his physicality because i think he does a, a little bit better job on switches um, it's just to, to your point, And I think, you know, Tillman has made this clear. He's still trying to figure out how to do all that everyone else has had the entire season to learn how to do. Uh, and it is going to take him some time, particularly, uh, for guys like him who aren't playing a ton of minutes. So you don't really have as many opportunities to develop the muscle memory, to learn this stuff mm -hmm. so that it becomes a second nature type of thing to you. So he, he's, it's a tough spot for him to be. They should in. get him a start down the stretch, honestly. Like, there would be nothing wrong with that. Well, I, I think that, you know, you look at the schedule and you look who's still left on it. Yeah, I think there's, he'll probably get one or two starts before they get to the playoffs. And that would be great for him to get out there and, and play a legitimate 20, 25 minutes uh, to not only just kind of shake some of the rust off, but also 
develop yeah. better chemistry with with his teammates. But him and Al, exactly. uh, they play well together. They really do. Uh, and I, I think that's going to be a tandem that we will see. Like, for example, you mentioned Philadelphia. There's no doubt about it that we'll see those two playing together uh, at different times in that game. Uh, because, you know, either one of those guys will, will get will draw that assignment and you feel a little bit better about Tillman for, for stretches having to deal with Embiid versus Luke. Yeah, I think – I mean, I think you're going to definitely see Tillman starting at some point down the stretch here. What do they got – how many games do they have left? They've got – Eight games eight. left. I mean, they they you you got a few more to go here that you want to get back on, you know, get some good momentum going into the playoffs. But we all know they're not going to be going, you know, balls to the walls the last few games of the year here. It just makes zero. Sense. No, it makes zero sense to do that. Mm -hmm. And so this was a good win to get because now that, that you can fall back on this type of performance and feel a lot better about the the two games prior against Atlanta and you can feel a little bit better about whoever's coming up next down the stretch here. Cause I know there's not really that many good, you got one against the bucks, but I think we all agree that that's not going to be, uh, they got a thunder game Wednesday, okay. Okay, a the Kings thunder. game Friday and a okay, bucks so, and Knicks game later. Okay. So they, they do, they do have a few, but I think those bucks and the bucks and Knicks are late kind of right. Like last yeah. few. And then the other okay. four are like blazers, wizards, hornets. So thunder and Kings again, two more, two good tests western conference western conference teams you know you can you can mess around with things like joe wants to do and i guess learn some lessons as he likes to call it <laughs> um another bench guy that stood out to me tonight not so much on the box score, but i thought pritchard was everywhere tonight mm -hmm. um and and he's given them some good men he played 17 minutes tonight i think that's a good number for him in the playoffs i mean he's getting some some good burn early you know when he goes in there he just plays hard man he's in there on the glass that offensive All rebound of was so great and he feels like he yeah. gets one every game it does right it, it's the weirdest he's literally the smallest guy on the damn court almost every game and yet he's the one guy that if i if you ask a fan who's the one guy that's going to get an offensive rebound for the celtics uh every game he's that guy it seems like whenever he's out there um, great at recognizing angles and spaces of, of to, to get in there. Uh, and is just a really smart, heady player at that end of the floor in terms of getting his hands on, on balls. But to your point, Jimmy, I think his minutes are going to be dictated in large part by how Drew Holiday is feeling. I think mm -hmm. if Drew is less than 100 percent is closer to 50 or 75, then I think you'll see, you know, you'll see Peyton in the high teens, low 20s. But if Drew is like 100 percent all out ready to go you're probably looking at something in double digits um maybe high maybe mid-teens at best uh but yep. he is going yep. to play there, there's absolutely no doubt about that and he's going to play not because they don't have any other option but because he's earned a right to play he's done right. enough good things at both ends of the floor he's not nearly as big a defensive liability as some thought he was and and, and a large part i think is because he's just getting a chance to play more and so he's getting more opportunity to, to learn and grow and just be a contributor to this team at both ends of the floor. Real quick, Bobby, before before you go, I just want to remind everybody before Amit makes the change, it is March Madness at the Garden Report as well. We know UConn's playing right now. I think they're winning. I don't know exactly what's going on. They just on went them. on a 27 to nothing run, Jimmy. Are you serious? I think they're winning. <laughs> okay, they're winning. They're winning then. We're not, we're not too concerned about UConn advancing to the Final Four. However, it's the Elite Eight here at CLNS, and right now it's the Kevin Jelly region that's live. <laughs> you got Tang Wade uh, is up against – I can't even read that, but it's up against uh, – look at this Boomer right here. So that's um, – Boomer Rage. That's a good matchup. And actually, I'm told that it's about 50-50 right now on YouTube. Uh, you guys can vote for that right here in the chat. Uh, Amit's going to switch that one over um, very shortly, and it's going to be the second – uh, and final Elite Eight matchup, Luke's Lemon Squares on That's Bobby's my birthday. Sleeper. On Bobby's birthday, no less. Against, do you have children? Which is, again, this this is the, the Kevin Jelly region is so far staying true to form. One, two, three, and four. The uh, Herman Gomez region is is a mess. We don't even know. I have no idea who's gonna come out of that one alive. But that's a wild one over Herman Gomez. But anyways, um, get your votes in, guys. And then after this show you can go over to CLNS Celtics Twitter account and those uh you can vote on that uh those matchups beyond this show uh, get another vote in there and then we will announce the winners uh in the final four we will announce at the next uh Celtics game when is the next game Monday Monday against the Hornets Monday. 
Okay, Monday against the Hornets. There you go. Grant Williams, return game. All right, Bobby, did you have something to add on? Did you have anything else to add on Pritchard, or did we? Did we did no, we game okay. love first put back. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, that's it. That's it for Pritchard. Sherrod, you did mention we're going to get to a lot of guys in the show. Don't don't be screaming at us for going in any specific order. But you did mention Porzingis close to the top of the show, and he was active as hell tonight. Four blocks, um, just an awesome game. Uh, Nineteen and ten for him. Four blocks, three assists. And he looked a moment for him too when he kept blocking Zion in the post on that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Play. That was, yeah. These are these are blocks against nobodies. This these are this is the big physical team, and and you know Porzingis is going toe to toe with these guys. And I think one of the questions you have about this team, the Celtics team, I would say toughness might be one, physicality. Um, mm -hmm. Zanis would say athleticism, which is probably true too, and mm -hmm. you know when they put in performances like when Pagali Porzingis can rip down, you know, can, can block four shots and rip down 10 boards. You're not as concerned about those things. Yeah. I mean, that, that and that's, you're going to need that if you're the Celtics. Because the, the one thing that that I, I find myself, you know, without even really thinking about it, reverting back to, and I, and I think most fans are, are like this with, with the Celtics, is that how is this team different from the team we saw a year ago or, or a couple years ago that, that went to the finals? And no matter how you – Come, no matter how you view that, it's hard to ignore the Porzingis effect. Uh, it's hard right. to ignore right. what having him on this team does for their ability to not only be successful, but to potentially win an NBA title. Uh, a seven-footer who can shoot from the perimeter can has a much better defensive presence around the rim than I thought. Uh, I, I, I still um, think about him when he was in New York. And how he was just basically a walking easy pass that everyone could score against. <laughs> um, that he was that he was that bad, and he's gotten obviously a lot better since then. Uh, but the versatility that he gives you from a defensive standpoint, the offensive, uh, you know, tools of talent that he's got, he has in his bag that he can whip out. He gives you a dimension that more nights than not is going to give you an edge. Now, obviously, in, in, the, in the two games in Atlanta, wasn't his finest hour. I think it's fair to say. Uh, but when you look at the totality of what he's meant to this team this year, uh, there have been very few nights like that where you see him play and you're thinking, you know, this guy is not that guy. But more not, more times than not, he is that guy. And, and this tonight, this this game was a great example of what he can do uh, against a really great player in Zion Williamson uh, mm -hmm. and against a team that's playing for something. Because uh, so that's this was this was really one of his uh, statistically. Easy to forget this game, but in terms of their ramping up towards the playoffs, this was the kind of game you'd like to see from him. Yeah, and you mentioned this, Rod. We haven't had many nights this year where we've gone, oh, Porzingis just didn't have it. Uh, he was bad tonight. He was super consistent to start this year. I know someone in the chat mentioned last three weeks, probably coming off that ailment, especially he had the uh, quad or whatever it was, a hamstring. He has slowed down a little bit. I think the physicality continues to bother him in a way that you wonder what's this going to look like in the playoffs if he's opposite of an Embiid or uh, someone like that because they're going to go small in these series. I don't think, as we said to start the year, Jimmy, maybe they go double big in a certain matchup. I think they're rolling with the small lineup. Uh, last game was the first time they played in three weeks together, so you expected there to be a little bit of a reacclimation there for that group. Uh, they go plus 13 last game, and I thought they looked pretty good again tonight. It's one of the best starting lineups in the NBA. So they're not going to get away from it. But fortunately, you can play Porzingis with a Horford. You can play uh, bigger. And if you need a matchup in a different way, you can put Porzingis on a guard like uh, Jaden Daniels tonight, uh, D uh, Dyson Daniels tonight. Uh, you can put him on a Herb Jones. And just stick them. Somebody the needed rim, to right? cover Herb Jones tonight. Yeah, and that's you know that's what Guy that's what hurt them early. Fired. Yeah, and you wonder if he kept hitting, maybe they lose this game. So you right. you're making a big risk when you hedge away from a guy, especially a guy who's getting hot. But credit to Joe who was stood and just taking those punches when needed. And usually those guys do end up slowing down uh, toward the end of a game. Because listen, that experiment late in the Hawks game where they switched him out on Murray did not work. I don't think that's where you want him playing in the playoffs. If he needs to get on a pick and roll, great. But you want him back at the basket. You want him defending the rim. 
and that's what allows him to have a four block game. And this, you know, he's not a great defender. He's a good defender, but he's great at protecting the rim. And so you want to keep him there as much as possible, but I'll give the Celtics credit for putting him in different positions and trying to get him used to what they were doing off uh, defensively. And, you know, that's something every coach on the team told me to start the year is we're going to, you know, make him uncomfortable. We're going to put him in different positions that he's probably not used to. And we're going to try to ramp him up. So he's able to play a bunch of different ways defensively late in the year, just in case we need it. And tonight I think was more him in his comfort zone, more him doing what he's best at, and then the offense just speaks for itself. I mean, it's just been so consistent all year, and he's just so dangerous against a guy like CJ at the free throw line. And, um, you know, maybe the touch is just off a little bit right now, uh, but I think come playoff time, especially with the rest and management they've done with him, I think he's going to be in a really good spot. Facts, my dog. We want to remind everybody that the good folks at Prize Picks brings you the garden report guys you want to go to download the prize picks app hit the promo code clns get a hundred percent deposit match up to one hundred dollars it really is that easy you're saying what is prize picks well it's the largest daily fantasy sports platform in north america the easiest and most exciting way to play dfs it's just you against the numbers instead of battling thousands of other players including pros and sharks you pick more or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. I was scrolling around prize picks today because that's what I do on a on a lazy. Did you make weekend, some picks? You know? I I did make a couple picks, and I actually am floating around baseball now because baseball is back. Uh, it's believe, time. Believe it or not, the Red Sox are actually <laughs> playing. They're playing games. at midnight. Yeah, They're not making a sound, but they are playing games, and you can you know keep it a little bit interesting. Wake up to a to uh, uh you know check out the results of of your of your of your um of who you played i i i taught i i hit more on shohei otani's uh total bases today so i'm waiting for that game to to start up that's a night game so that'll keep me that'll keep me interested i'm a shohei guy um hopefully he's hopefully he i, I hope, on I hope himself he doesn't tonight. have any picks <laughs> <laughs> yeah hopefully he put a bet in on himself tonight so we can get a couple of hits um but other than oh, that, this is not going well for him. yeah but anyways guys you want to hit you want to hit up prize picks uh, we really appreciate the sponsor and uh it is a lot of fun so prize picks hit the promo code clns let me make sure i get this right download the app today and use code clns for a first deposit match up to 100 again down the app first 100 will be matched up to 100 um pick more pick less it's that easy Okay, I would say the prize again. We we mentioned it briefly, but the prize tonight for the Celtics was Jalen Brown, and yeah. not so much the offense, which you know, a uh, uh, pretty pedestrian seventeen points for Brown's not gonna not gonna blow anybody out of the water. But I think some some of the ways he did score his aggressiveness, but most importantly, the just the defense. And if if he's making a run for one of the all defensive teams, I mean, this is one of the highlights that the Celtics are going to be, or one of the games that the Celtics are going to be sending in. Or sending around uh, to everybody with a vote because um, this was a, just a, a strong performance from start to finish. He was he was all over the place today. He was, and the, the thing right now is there's about five or six guys that you can make you know a fairly strong case for being all defensive. But I I think Jalen is positioning himself better than most because of not only the caliber of players that he's showing he can hold his own against defensively, but also the fact that one. He's still getting his at the other end of the floor. And two, the Celtics are winning. And typically for those all defensive positions, all, you know, in positions basically not involving MVP, there's a tendency to, if it, if the, if there's a, if there are two players who are relatively even, you tend to go with the one who is putting his team, his team in the best position to win. Uh, and I think Jalen, what he's been able to do defensively, uh, has been really important for the Celtics team, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I'm not sure. Well, I don't believe they would be where they are now if he had not elevated his game at that end of the floor, because uh, he takes a tremendous amount of pressure off of, you know, his teammates when he's able to defend at the level that he is at. And keep in mind, he's playing with two other all NBA defensive players and drew holiday, you know, and Derek White, right. and then you've got another guy in Jason Tatum who stepped his game up defensively as well. Uh, and so 
the fact that he's still playing with great players defensively and still managing to stand out more nice than not for his work at that end of the floor, I think it bodes well for his chances of being on one of those uh, all NBA defensive teams. Yeah, I haven't put too much thought into that and looked at the guys who are in contention, but I have followed his case all year pretty closely. And uh, tonight, another example of how much of a tone he set on that end. And tonight, especially him blowing up plays in the backcourt, that one where he knocked it away from, I think, Zion, uh, chased it down and put up a shot that White put back. That's the kind of stuff you want to start to see them do a little bit more into the playoffs. Put some pressure on the other team. They've allowed some teams to do it to them in some second halves here. For them to finally blow up the Pelicans offense and uh, play the way they're capable of uh, defensively, he was a big part of that. And I think he'll take a matchup and guard it for the entirety of a game if he needs to. He'll uh, put some extra on-ball pressure and physicality on guys. So I, I love what he's brought on that end. And, you know, just an overall commentary on the team and what they did tonight. Look at this, Bobby. Thank nice you. Little bir- nice little nice little happy birthday for, for you. you. We'll let you keep all that. I don't even know what. Wow. Well done. Oh, it's 20 bucks. Never mind. We're splitting that. I was like, what's an A? But... <laughs> <laughs> Who's like, forget that. <laughs> nah, that's, Bobby's, that's Bobby's birthday money right there. Lemon Scratch, everybody. Thank you very much. Must Lemon Scratch, baby. What were you saying now, Bob, before I cut you off? I was I was going to say, um, and this. real quick, on Sherrod's point on Holiday and White, Brown holding opponents to 45% from the field Look as well. This, so he's right in line money with them. rolling in for you, Thanks, dude. Colin. Unbelievable. <laughs> so here's what I'll say to you, Jimmy. Okay. I've said this for three years, and I haven't said it much this year because I've been pretty happy with their defense uh, for a lot of this season. I think they've been consistent. I think they do their job on that end. Uh, They have a good system that plays to everybody's strengths. I want to see it ratchet up uh, late in the year like it did tonight. I want to see them be a team that hangs their hat on defense because they've been great offensively this year. I think they found a lot of answers on offense, but they'll still have those droughts. They'll still have those games where the threes aren't falling. Didn't they start pretty slow from three in this game too, uh, I want to say? They have those moments, and... They're always going to have those moments just based on who their stars are and, you know, their dependence on the three and blah, 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 blah. But they can always defend. They have the personnel to be the best team in the league by miles on that uh, front. And listen, there's some other great offenses out there. Denver might have a better offense. You know, the Clippers at their peak might be able to hang with you. Even the Bucks, like the Bucks have every bit the offense that the Celtics do, but the defense shouldn't even be close. And if they're defending like this every night, I don't even think it matters if you have some slip-ups here or there on offense. You're going to be in position to win a championship just because I don't think anyone else can defend like this. They have amazing personnel on that end, and especially when you're able to play Horford and Porzingis together for longer stretches like you did tonight. Get aggressive. Go to some more aggressive scheming. Uh, take some risks on that end. I know you want to play sound and discipline, but you need to be the team that affects the other team not vice versa. How many times, Jimmy, in mm-hmm. this month have we said, oh, the other team really ratcheted up that pressure and it you know, messed right. with the Celtics? We haven't said too often this month, wow, the Celtics turned up the heat on defense and just completely blew up that other team. Tonight was the first time I feel like we could say that. Yeah, and, and the big part of that, Bobby, yeah. is, is the versatility that they have at that end of the floor. The fact that you really can't move the ball around and find that perfect matchup that you can exploit and and feel confident that you can exploit it over and over and over again. And the Celtics have no answer for it. Uh, And and that to me is one of the biggest problems that teams in a (laughs) playoff series are going to have with the Celtics is the adjustments game. Uh, The Celtics have the kind of personnel that if you it feels like you're playing whack-a-mole a lot of times, I think, in a best of seven with the Celtics, where you may address one hole and then two or three others will pop up uh, because they have that type of, of bench. They have that type of versatility at both ends of the floor. So uh, I'm I'm not as bothered by some of the one-off losses that they suffer because I think about it from the standpoint of, can that team that just beat them do it three more times? Yeah. Uh, and right. I, I just that – that's point, yeah. That's what I keep coming back to with this team. Because if they lose a game, that, that it's one thing. But can that team do this three more times and send them home for the summer? I don't think there are well, many teams in the league that can do that this year. Speaking of that, Jimmy, let's take a look. The birthday wishes are rolling in, by the way, Bobby. You got five you, from Victoria. 
This guy wants to buy you fish tacos in Cali, so that's pretty <laughs> cool too. Thank you for that. <laughs> I love fish tacos. <laughs> there you go. Cali's the place for it. What are you? What uh, are you about to pull up? What are you about to pull up, Bob? You want me? No, I'm not going to share my screen, but please the, do. No, share your screen. Just do it for a second. The playoff probably. I don't even know how to do it here. Oh, okay. I thought uh, you knew. Anything. Forget it. All right, but talk to us then. The playoff probabilities are shifting quickly. Every night, fewer and fewer games left to go. It was really tight, but after that last Hawks game, the Hawks moved up to second most likely Celtics playoff opponent. Uh, but now, a little bit of separation after last night. The Sixers are now in a firm position uh, to become that eight seed. 27.2% chance that the Celtics see them round one. Hawks up to 21.7%. The Heat, who continue to win and rise, they're actually only a game behind the Pacers for six now. Oh boy, uh, that's a team you don't want to get hot. Yeah, yeah, but that also means they're less likely to see the Celtics round one. So uh, they're that'd down to 18.9%. That's that'd actually below the Bulls, here. who are 19.6. So Unbelievable. What do you think of Philly round one, Jimmy? So I was actually going to, I was going to, I'm glad you asked because I was going to bring that up. Who do you guys don't want to see? I think obviously Embiid's a wild card here, right? Have we gotten an update recently on, on his So Woj said he's going to come back and play a few regular season games before the playoffs. Okay. So, I mean, listen, if you can avoid pl uh, playing against when healthy, a top, you know, top two, three player in the league, you want to avoid that in the first round, because even if you do get past them, that's going to make it a lot more difficult. That's going to be a, you know, a, a tough physical series. Maxi, Maxi can get hot at any moment. And then if they steal a game in Boston, let's say, or right after the bat, they're all of a sudden going wild in Philadelphia and they've got all the confidence in the world. So I'd love to avoid them in the first round. I know the Celtics just dropped two to the Hawks, so it might make no sense to be like, oh, let's play the Hawks. But I just don't see them as a team that's going to be consistently like – challenging the Celtics. I mean, I think the Celtics clearly dropped the ball on, the, on that little trip there. I think they took them for granted. They just couldn't get themselves up enough for the game. And they've also got a, a lot of film to look at to correct some of those mistakes that they made in both of those games. So I it might would, be good to see a Philly though, because uh, you have to scheme for Embiid. You have to figure out how you're going to deal with that. You might have to good in what way later, just to prepare you for. Oh, so you're just uh, assuming gonna they're going to win. Whoever they play, you have no issues with because they're just going to cruise at some point through the series. I mean, based on what we've seen between them and the Heat this year, I think you have to think they're going to beat them. You're always going to give Miami the benefit of the doubt that they're going to be a different team come playoff time. So if you really want to avoid a massive first-round disappointment, maybe that would be best. Mm -hmm. I don't think Philly, even with Embiid playing well, has it in them to win the series. Does it go six, seven games? Do they able are they able to extend it a little bit? They were a team early, Phil, uh, Jimmy, that you know pushed the Celtics in those games, especially those early games in Philly. Uh, those were really tough uh, victories mm -hmm. for the Celtics there, uh, and they actually lost there once too. Uh, so this matchup's challenging. I don't think Embiid will be healthy enough to legitimately go out there and beat that's you. That's the key. Yeah, I mean, if he's set, even if he's 75%, that's not enough. And he's probably I just don't want a series there. and Chicago I feel like would be this way and maybe Atlanta too if the Celtics take it seriously. You don't want a team that you're just going to walk through. It's going to be easy. You know, Indy could be like that too. They're banged up now and defense defense has been bad all year long and Halliburton slipping now, so they're in the mix now a little bit more than they were before. But this Philly series, to me, makes all the sense in the world as a table setter for a playoff run here. Uh, they're not the Heat. I think the Heat would be much more difficult and much more of a challenge if you're trying to set yourself up for a run here. Uh, but I think Philly's the perfect combination of challenging but beatable. Mm -hmm. What are you sure? Yeah. Who do you want? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think when all is said and done, I, I think that the Celtics – will avoid playing Miami. I just think Miami is going to somehow wind up being on the other side of the bracket where they're, they got to deal with yeah. whoever the number two seed is. Uh, and, and, and yeah. Philly between Philly and Atlanta, I think, Phil, I think the Celtics will play either Philly or Atlanta in that first round. Uh, once the play in tournament stuff is, is done and, and through. And if it's Philly, I will, I love the chances because Embiid will not have had much of a ramp up to really get himself in the kind mm -hmm. of condition that, he would need to be in in order to carry the Sixers team past the Celtics. I think it'll go five, maybe six games, no more than that. 
uh, Embiid will put up big numbers. But the Celtics, I just think the biggest uh, the biggest challenge that they're going to have in the series against Philadelphia is themselves. That's, to me, who I worry most about. Because you don't want them to go into that looking at Joel Embiid as being less than Joel Embiid and treat him uh, without the kind of respect that he should be getting and the attention that he should be getting. Uh, so I think that that's that's a series they should win. I, and B's not going to be fully – they won't get the full effect of Joel. And I just think that Tatum and Jalen and Derek White and and all those guys, they're, they're just too locked in on what the goal is this year, and that's to win the championship. I, and I think they're going to handle their business no matter mm-hmm. who's in the way to make sure they position themselves as best they can to be the last team standing when all said and done. Yeah. That Hawks team's tough too. I think they're starting to hit their stride a little bit. Hit their stride. I mean, they shouldn't even, if, if they didn't put a play in game, uh, (laughs) they wouldn't be in the playoffs. It wouldn't even be a discussion. I mean, they're, (laughs) they're five games below 500. They have no business even being in the playoffs. It's kind of sad that they, well, that's a good point, Jimmy. If the Celtics have a ton of trouble with any of these teams, a bad sign for the Celtics. It, it says more right. about them uh, than yeah. But you know what? I I I can't, I can't get too caught up in something like that happening because I mean the last championship the Celtics won was in 08, and they damn near got their asses eliminated in the first round by the Atlanta Hawks and Al Horford. And yeah. that Atlanta and that team was not that good. They were okay, but they it they were like an upstart. Going. Yeah. What's yeah. that? They were more of like an upstart Hawks team, right? They yeah. had I mean like a young Al Horford and like it was like Josh Smith and yeah. all these guys. Yeah, but I, I thought that Hawks team was 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 more talented than this one. Uh, oh, totally. Because this team, you, you've got Trey Young, you had DeJounte, and that's pretty much all you got. That Hawks team had multiple guys who you had to worry about. Uh, we even talked mm-hmm. about Joe Johnson was back on that team too. Yeah. So I, I just I, I just think that whoever the Celtics play in that first round that, that will emerge from a play-in format, that will be a five, maybe six-game series. Uh, no more yeah. than that. And, and, you know. It shouldn't okay, even be no, six. Right. If you had to pick one team that you'd want to play from, like like right now, you in, if in the playoff playing format, you've got Miami, Philly, Chicago, and Atlanta. And of those four, if you're Boston, Chicago would probably be the one team you'd want to play. Uh, but after them, I'd say it's probably Philly uh, because their best player is not going to be at full strength. The team you probably don't want to play is Atlanta because Atlanta, I think, is one of those teams that they, they've figured something out that yeah. others haven't uh, to compete with the Celtics. Uh, and yeah, that's 40 something shots with your guy, yeah. <laughs> 44 <laughs> points, 44 <laughs> shots. There yeah. you go. That's the, uh, that's the, the secret <laughs> recipe and a hell of a lot of offensive rebounds. Right. Yeah. That's well, that's see, that's the thing that the Celtics would have to make it. You go into that game. That's the first thing on the whiteboard, right? Shot sure, in the, in the, in the locker room. You I know, would hope so. Box out like freaking keep them off the glass. Follow the ball. Exactly. Yeah. Keep these guys <laughs> off the glass. Eliminate the second chance points. And mm-hmm. then, you know, that the, that's how you're going to do it. Um, one of the guys that can help do that, Sherrod, is your guy, Derek White. Derek White. We haven't really talked about him much. We talked about him off the top. He had the, he had, I would say, the game changing shot. The Celtics. They were down. White, White, White misses that shot. The Celtics going to halftime down. People are talking about how they came out flat, and yeah, they clawed back in it. But that changed the whole momentum. Just the way that it was off a turnover coming down the court. Um, he just went straight into the locker room, and you could tell that the guys on the team were all fired up, right, heading right into the halftime, and they just used that momentum in the second, into the uh, third quarter, and that was the quarter, Bobby, that they limited the Pelicans to 11 points and played one of their best, you know, defensive uh, quarters in a long, long time. Mm-hmm. I just, the white effect. I, I just want to see Derek be, get his number called more when the game is on the line in the fourth quarter, he has shown the ability to when the shot clock is winding down, when the, when the game clock is winding down, he can deliver. I and just, as much, and as much as Tatum is the best player on the team and no one is going to dispute that he is not your guy in the clutch. It's not, he's not. It was, it, and it, it's not because he's not getting enough opportunities. He's getting plenty of those. He's just not at this point built for that. Uh, and that doesn't diminish him as a great player because people, w- when they think about Michael Jordan and all the awesome things he did, remember his best moments in the biggest games were passes, not necessarily shots. I mean, he's got two championships based in large part for his willingness to give someone else the opportunity to shine in that moment, as opposed to him forcing the action. 
Tatum, yeah. I think, has to get to that point. And I think Joe Mazzulla can help him do that a little bit more. Where when you call him plays, make Tatum the third option and make Derek White or and Drew Holiday or Derek White and Jalen Brown options one and two. Force the defense to do something that they're not comfortable doing because you don't want to double Jalen. You don't want to tilt towards Derek. You want to play those guys straight up. And if you're playing them straight up, they can murder you down the stretch. And if you get in a situation where they're playing, teams are defending them a little bit tighter, which will create more opportunities for Tatum, then you take advantage of the mismatch because Tatum does not have the mismatch like you want him to have down the stretch because teams are loading up on him. They're, they're daring him to take a contested shot or just keep dribble, keep dribble, keep dribbling, wait till four seconds are left, and then you make your move. That's exactly what defenses want. Uh, but when the ball is in the hands of someone like a Derek White or, or Jalen Brown with about mm-hmm. 10 seconds left, you really don't know what's about to happen. You don't know whether they're <laughs> going to look for their shot or they're going to look for Tatum. So I just, wish know. They, <laughs> I just wish they'd be a little bit more diverse in, in terms of how they approach those end of game. We need a basket right now moments oh, totally. and, not, and not give us the same. Give the ball to Tatum. Wait till it's five seconds left. Then Tatum so makes a move, and then the double, the double team with about five Step seconds, like they always come in. Yeah. And so it's, I just wish there was a little more unpredictability, especially considering the types of options that he has at his disposal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's all valid, and we've been calling for it uh, all year. I want to pull up his stats in crunch time because I can't imagine he's being used very often in those situations. Oh, I don't think so. I mean, he's the inbounder practically, isn't he? In yeah, a lot he of those is. situations. So. Hell, he have makes, to really he get creative. Makes, Jimmy, he even makes shots on the damn inbounds. Right, right, right. right. Oh, yeah. That on. was honestly such a good effort on his part. I mean, it was just obviously it was too it was too close to the rim, but that's the only way you're going to potentially even get you. It's just going to be a, t- a just a tip from of the ball near. It can't yeah. be over the cylinder because then it's going to be a shot and goal ten situation. Or I don't even know if it would be because you're out of bounds. But it just has to be touched. It just has to be touched. Just, just touched. So that really was that was the best. It was a perfect possible, throw. It was the best possible inbounds. Somebody just <laughs> needed to get. Even if it was, even if it was a Hawks player, anyone who would, would have just grazed that ball, that would have went in, and that would have yeah. been game. So it really was the. It perfect was amazing. Inbounds. I mean, what's so you, funny too? You love his uh, smarts, but man, you could really use his shot. Out there, Shroud. I agree with you. Yeah, and he is. Uh, I just pulled up the numbers: fifty-three percent from the field in crunch time this year, which is the second best. Uh, what, what are the actual the like attempts? Sixteen for thirty. Uh, so he does have the third most attempts, tied with Porzingis. But forty shots for Jalen. He's shooting fifty percent in those late game situations, and then uh, Tatum, of course, thirty-six percent with sixty-one shots. Uh, so you need more diversity. You need more. Yeah. Of your offense in those situations. Well, 100 shots between offense. the two of them, basically. 100 shots. 100 crunched. Uh, 100 <clears throat> yeah. shots between the two of them in crunch time. Yeah. So you need to run your offense in those late game situations because it's so good. You do it all game. I get the thinking. Joe doesn't want them to turn the ball over by throwing the ball around and doing crazy stuff. You want to actually be able to get those shots off, especially in like the last minute, last 10 second situation. So you get why you go to Tatum there to some degree. Uh, but this is the last three to five minutes of the game that we're talking about. And if you do enough early uh, to put the game away, then you don't have to go down to the last shot to the last minute there. So avoiding those situations entirely, I think, is what you're looking for there. And it is funny, Jimmy, that pass. Uh, we were at shoot around that morning and he was standing there in that like inbounds area, taking shots from there, uh, yeah. trying to hit him. <laughs> so he finally That's hit funny. one. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, Porzingis turned to him. He's like, you're working on your inbound? He's like, he's smiling over there. And then he actually had to do it that night, which was really funny. I mean, it's one of those things it. where it, 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 it helps to practice it because those situations come up, I guess, more than you'd more than you think. I mean, that right. really was the perfect inbounds. It's just unfortunate that not one guy uh, could get a finger on the ball. I mean, not, you know, it's it's like hockey, right? You just get a you get the slap shot from the from the blue line and you just get a, the stick on it just just enough in front of the goalie to deflect it but it still goes in so that's really the only way you had a chance to win um unfortunately it just didn't happen guys um we want to remind you guys also that the garden report is brought to you by PXG and when we think of PXG we probably think like unbelievable golf clubs guys but now they're in the apparel game and just for watching the garden report you can get 10% off on all apparel. Go to 
pxg.com slash garden and save 10%. So if you're looking for polos, quarter zips, pants, golf shoes, um, what almost else that got? time. It, 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 yeah. Jackets, dresses, and skirts for the, for the, the women golfers out there. I mean, we have, if 50 you love plus, golf, Jimmy, was, you, you're going to be getting there in out there over the next week or two. Like I, I could have been out there today. It was so windy today. I, I mean, my balls already spraying all over the, <laughs> all over the course. The wind is not doing me any favors and it might actually straighten it out to be completely honest, but it was a windy one, but that's why you go to PSG.com and you and you bundle up a little bit. You gotta you gotta fight the elements. It was it was a nice enough day to get you in the golf mindset, guys. So you want to make sure you hit up uh, pxg.com slash garden, elevate your style game on and off the course with the PXG Spring and Summer 2024 collection. So go to pxg.com slash garden and save 10% on all apparel. That's pxg.com slash garden for 10% on all our apparel. Guys, it's a birthday night for Bobby, so we're gonna we're gonna get out of here a little bit on the earlier side. But um, you know, any any closing closing thoughts, Bobby, or anything, Chara, that you guys want to hit on that we haven't yet? Um, I think we. The floor is yours, Bobby. Birthday boy, take us out of here. Well, I'm gonna go right to Grant Williams. Can't wait to see him on Monday. Oh boy, <laughs> for to see him trying to defend Tatum Brown. Can he actually have a big game? I'm a little skeptical, but I. I excited to see him try to have a revenge game against the Celtics. This is his first game. You know, he's going to try to, if there's any guy who's going to try to do that, like that, is he going to mix it up? Are there going to be any scuffles? Uh, It happens naturally with him. It feels like he just got into it with Draymond again uh, the other night. I saw that Draymond tried to kick him in the, in the nuts. (laughs) So I wasn't gonna go. Not wasn't Draymond. Gonna Draymond would yeah. never do something yeah. like that. Right, right. It doesn't sound right. Well, Draymond punked him on it wasn't too long ago where Draymond basically said on at the podium that Grant was nobody liked Grant, right? I mean, that's essentially what he said, right? That Grant's yeah. Yeah, you know, so yeah. If, if you're Grant, that's a huge that's huge disrespect on your name. You gotta kinda go, you kinda gotta go at him. Saying him. some stuff about him. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's getting their shots in. So this is Grant's and there's not really much else for Grant, I guess, to play for this season being on Charlotte. But this is uh, this is his Super Bowl, I guess, on Monday. Go for Grant. I hope Grant plays well. I do. What are you going to ask him, Bobby? You must have a couple of questions that you've been thinking. They come to Boston later this month. This one's a road game. Oh, okay. so. this one's in the road. OK, I didn't know if you were heading out to it, but that wouldn't make much sense, I guess. Basically, no, they'll be here in a week or two. Okay. I don't know. I wonder if will, will, will Grant else. get a video? He'll will get Grant a video. get a video tribute? He'll, and we'll and we'll all have an audience with Grant before the game because oh yes, Grant will be more than willing to talk to all of us before the game. <laughs> there will be at least like two, I would say, headline type quotes from Grant uh, after. I just hope he doesn't come to the arena in the Batman outfit. I hope he doesn't come in oh. with the Batman outfit. But, but like, if there's any, would anyone be surprised if he did? I was gonna say if anybody would, that's my pick for doing that. Absolutely. Just remember, Boston probably doesn't go to the 2022 finals without Grant's game seven. That's a good point. And they that's probably do, and they probably do go to the 2023 finals <laughs> with without his performance. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we can balance. Selective memory, I guess, is is a thing. <laughs> uh, well, Shirad, you, you, you got anything before we head out? I, I got nothing, man. I got I got nothing for you. Uh, happy birthday, Bobby. Um, many, many more to come. That's and, right. you know, uh, maybe get some Luke Lemon squares or something. Man. I'm, su- I'm surprised Luke hasn't done them for you, man. Yeah, I, maybe. I have a feeling. Maybe on They're Wednesday on there'll be a little something waiting for me. Yeah. Yeah, there might be yeah. something waiting for you. The big the, the you want to tell everybody how old you are? Is that is that a secret? Twenty-six. Twenty-six. He's entering his prime. Exactly. I think some somebody in the comments said that you might have to hit up Jay King again because you're coming into your prime years. Uh the basketball yeah, it's a game whole might different go a world. differently. That game was twenty sixteen, I want to say. Eight years really? ago. Eight years ago. Eighteen? So you were I might have been 18. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's right. Thanks, Rain. Appreciate you. So, yeah, whole yeah. different world when you're 20. Look at Tatum at 18 versus Tatum at 26. Ah, uh, I was waiting for that. I was waiting for that, com- that come. 
Yeah, you can grow the facial hair a little bit. Tatum better. just turned twenty six as well. Yeah, March third. Really? Oh, you guys are going toe to toe. Similar career trajectories, I think. You're on your way up too, Bobby. There you go. <laughs> there you go. All right, guys, that'll do it. Happy Easter to everybody who celebrates it as well. Easter Sunday tomorrow, and have a great weekend. Nice little Saturday night coming up here. We got some college basketball and big women's college basketball final on deck Monday night, I believe, right? That's uh, Iowa versus LSU. Rematch. I think they yeah, it's the Elite Eight, but it's a rematch. So looking forward oh, to that. The Elite Eight. Yeah, it's not the damn, but still, it's going to feel like the, it's going to feel like it's the, yeah, the winner could Kaylee usually go on. Every game feels that way. Every game yeah. Kaylee's in feels that way. So, yeah. by the way, I guess um, I think Indiana's in position to draft Clark. And uh, they're going to be opening up at Connecticut. And I think the tickets are going for like $200. Wow. Yep. That's impressive. Yeah, that is. Very impressive. Well, I, I, I saw a debate recently that she should play in the NBA. We won't get into that one. but I, <laughs> Well, there's a big good. three offer out there for $5 million yeah. for my I have a feeling she's going to be making a lot of money outside of the WNBA with some of these. I got a feeling you might be on to something, Jimmy. <laughs> She'll be able to make. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right, guys, that'll do it. You guys have a great one. Let me actually find the outro here because I know Amit's got an outro. He does. Peace. Can you say hard hats, folks? Hard hats, lunch pail, steel to a boot? Anything short of a championship this year is a failure. Look real. at this boomer right here. You've just got so much talent here. Somebody said we need to apologize for... Wait, Amit's got an outro for us, I think. No, he doesn't. He said he was going to work on an outro. He had a phenomenal game.